Hi, I'm Chris Roussel and I am the rector of St. John's Episcopal Church in Lynchburg, Virginia. I welcome you to this walk through Holy Week. Although we are in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic and are asked to self-quarantine, we can still travel far away with the use of our imaginations. To do so, we need to prepare ourselves and the space around us. This journey will take some time, so many of you may want to have a glass of water nearby. Turn off all mobile devices and certainly eliminate the distraction of television. Give yourself permission to enter into this experience as fully as possible. Find a comfortable chair, take off your shoes perhaps, and put on comfortable clothes. This journey will take us from the Last Supper through the crucifixion up to the Easter resurrection. Some might choose to divide this journey into three distinct stages for Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter Sunday. Have a pen and paper handy to make note of the timestamp on the video when you hit pause so that you can return and pick up right where you left off. Now, in order to fully immerse ourselves into this experience in body, mind, and spirit, we will have to suspend some things that we know 2,000 years after this ex actual experience took place. We must first admit our ignorance. We don't know what being a first century Jewish follower of Jesus was really like, but we can enter into the story as best as possible by asking the Holy Spirit to take over our senses what we see, what we hear, what we taste, what we touch, and what we smell. We ask the wisdom of God to enter into this experience with us and for us. In this experience, we are invited into anamnesis, a special kind of remembering that makes the past even present now for us. But first, we must embrace amnesia, asking for a holy forgetting. We must forget what we know, forget that you know what Jesus is doing at the Last Supper, forget that you know that the cross is not the end of the story for Jesus, forget you know that the empty tomb is a victory. Instead, become a disciple of Jesus. Allow yourself to be shocked confused and afraid as you watch these things unfold and take place in front of you for the first time. Imagine what Jerusalem looks like from a broad perspective. See the huge temple off in the distance looming over everything. See the upper room where Jesus reclines with you and his friends for a Passover meal. See the table that is set. See the sandals piled up by the door. Smell the roasted lamb. Feel the warmth of the bodies crammed into a small space together. Taste the wine that is given to you in a cool cup. Transport yourself back in time and space, leaving this time and space behind. And so now, come with me for a walk through Holy Week. Walk with me up the stairs on the back of a simple house in Jerusalem. We follow Jesus and the other disciples, feeling pushed by our friends behind us. Everyone is filled with nervous energy. The stone steps are dusty. A breeze blows and the smell of fresh Jerusalem sage fills your nose. You enter the upper room. What do you see? A rug on the floor with the Passover meal being prepared by the women. Cushions around the rug that serve as a dining space. There are basins and water jugs. Candlelight flickers from several places throughout the room. The stone wall is cool to the touch. As a first century Jew, you've been expecting a Messiah. As a follower of Jesus, you think that the expected Messiah might just now be sitting in front of you in Jerusalem during Passover. And you know that Passover is significant because you grew up with it each year. You've heard the stories since your childhood about how 1,500 years ago your ancestors were slaves in Egypt, 
to set them free. God ensured their safety through a sacrificial meal, the Passover meal. You know that your Israelite ancestors, slaves in Egypt, on the cusp of being set free, were to sacrifice an unblemished male lamb, one year old, which is in its prime, a perfect lamb, undefiled in any way, and that in sacrificing it, not a bone of it could be broken. The blood of the animal was to be spread on the doorposts and the lintels, soaking into the wood, indicating a house where the Passover was held, so that the angel of death would pass over the house. Through the blood of the lamb, soaked into the wood, the inhabitants were then delivered from death. The blood of the lamb had power to save your ancestors from death. As a first century Jew in the upper room, you also know that the Passover sacrifice was not completed with the death of the lamb, but with the command to eat its flesh. And you know that Passover was not a one-time act 1,500 years prior, but was an annual event known as a remembrance. This remembrance had been kept alive for 1,500 years and allows you and your ancestors to not just and your descendants to not just remember the Exodus, but to participate it in full in real time. You know that the Passover had evolved from something that happened one night in all the homes of God's chosen people in Egypt, not only saving them from death, but freeing them from slavery and captivity to become this remembrance in Jerusalem each year at the temple. You grew up going to Jerusalem every year with your family and witnessed the sacrifice of over 256,000 lambs for 2.7 million people. You know firsthand how much blood that produces in the temple. You know the smell of the lambs being roasted. You've seen all along the streets and roads of Jerusalem how the lambs are skewered with rods into the shape of a cross. The 256,500 crucified lambs are everywhere. In that upper room, you know that Passover night was often referred to as a night of watching because during the first Passover, families kept prayerful watch to make sure that the angel of death passed over them, but also because in your own time, there is still watching, not for the angel of death, but for the coming of the Messiah. And you now find yourself in an upper room with your friends, Jesus assuming the rule, the role of the father of the house. Conversation abounds as Jesus gets up and washes Peter's feet first, then James and John, then Judas, then others, and even you. The water is surprisingly warm as your friend from Nazareth looks into your eyes and smiles. You feel small, yet your smallness allows you to feel filled with love like you've never felt before. As Jesus dries your feet with a towel wrapped around his waist, he keeps eye contact with you, telling the room that you and those around him are to go and do likewise. When, you wonder, where am I to go, your mind asks as you go back to your place at the far end of the room. There is a shift in the energy of the room as Jesus whispers warnings of betrayal. Suddenly the air gets tense as eyes dart around with suspicion, fear, and accusation. You strain to hear exactly what is being said as Jesus whispers to John, takes a morsel of bread, dips it into the Hariseth sauce, and hands the piece to Judas. Candlelight flickers wildly. The room goes silent as those next to Jesus look with horror, not at some breach of etiquette by Judas, but because of some revelation you could not hear over the noise. They're all staring at an otherwise oblivious Judas, whose money sack falls out of his lap and lands loudly on the floor in the midst of this sudden silence. You hear Jesus tell Judas, to do what he has to do quickly. But you missed the first part. Was he telling Judas to go get more food? 
Was Judas going to give money to the poor? Why did Judas look ominous so suddenly? Judas stepped over people, heading out the door with the money sack jingling like an out-of-tune chime in his hand. With Judas gone, the attention goes back to Jesus, who tells everyone that he will be going soon, but that none of you can go with him. You hear Jesus say that you are to love one another as he has loved you. But Simon Peter is indignant. His brow furrows as he boasts like he usually does, saying that he'll go wherever Jesus goes. Jesus and Peter go back and forth until Jesus puts an end to it, saying that Peter will deny him three times before the cock crows in the morning. Oh, there's awkward silence in the room. What does that even mean, you wonder? Things settle down as Jesus begins the meal. This is no ordinary meal. It's a Passover meal. You've already noticed that it's like no other Passover meal you've ever experienced. Since you were a child, you've known the ritual and routine of Passover, the pouring out of the blood of the perfect lamb into a sacred vessel at the temple, but the vessel of blood was given to a priest in the temple who splashed it onto the altar, representing the one blood of God's one family and done for the forgiveness of sins. You've seen the lamb skewered on a cross before. You know that the death of the lamb doesn't complete the Passover sacrifice, but eating the lamb does. And you know that at the eating of the lamb, there are four cups of wine that must be consumed in a certain order, for certain reasons, accompanied by certain prayers. These steps were known as the Seder, or the Order. Everyone would know the order of things to come that night, even your non-Jewish Greek-speaking friends who called the Passover by its Greek name, Pascha, or Paschal. What happens around you in the upper room that night would one day be referred to not as the Passover mystery, but the Paschal mystery. As part of the Jewish Passover custom, you and your friends, including Jesus, have been fasting since 3 o'clock p.m., the hour of the evening sacrifice. It is now exactly 24 hours before the most gruesome death you have ever seen. But we've not come to that yet, so you're still in the upper room, perhaps now hearing a stomach grumble from hunger. Jesus sits at the head of the table, just as you've seen your dad do every year of your life for Passover. With him, you recline at the table, fully aware that reclining at meals symbolized freedom, the freedom won for you in the Exodus following the first Passover. The first of the four cups of wine is prepared as Jesus mixes the wine with a little water for the cup of sanctification. You know this as the Kiddush cup, which blesses and makes holy all Sabbath days and festivals like Passover. Jesus says the typical Jewish blessing, in part, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. After the blessing, the food is brought out, but not yet eaten. Unleavened bread, symbolizing the haste with which your ancestors left Egypt, not giving the bread time to rise. A dish of bitter herbs, symbolizing the bitterness of 40 years in the desert. A bowl of hariseth, a nut, fruit, and honey mixture that represents the mortar used to build Pharaoh's empire. And roasted lamb. Set on the table, the lamb is referred to as the goof, or the body of the lamb. The food is laid out, but the second cup of wine, known as the Haggadah cup, or the cup of proclamation, is mixed but not drunk. Your dad, back in the old days, and now Jesus, now, today, proclaims all that God had done for them in freeing Israel from the bondage of slavery in Egypt. He also reminds you of the meaning of the different foods in front of you. This was the heart of the meal. After you finish praying and sing, singing, the meal would be eaten after a blessing over the unleavened bread. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, who brings forth bread from the earth. But Jesus adds to this traditional blessing and says, Take, eat, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. After the meal, you know the third cup of wine comes and is also blessed. This is the Baraka cup. 
Instead of the usual prayer, you hear Jesus say something different and strange. He tells all of you that this cup is the new covenant in His blood, which will be shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. You've seen your friend and teacher Jesus do some strange things, but this is one of the strangest. What's happening to the old covenant? Why is there now an, a new covenant? Perhaps the rest of the meal will reveal the answer as you lean forward with your elbows on your knees to hear him more clearly. As a devout Jew, you're fully expecting now the fourth and final cup of wine which concludes the Passover meal. This is the Hallel cup, the cup of praise. But instead of the fourth cup, Jesus says that he will not drink the fruit of the vine until the day he drinks it with you new in the kingdom of his Father. Suddenly, Jesus and everyone else sings some hymns, gets up and goes out, walking towards the Mount of Olives. You're confused. Without drinking the fourth cup, Passover is not complete. Where is everyone going? You and your friends follow Jesus, murmuring among yourselves, trying to make sense of everything that you've seen and heard. Jesus slips into a garden known as Gethsemane, the garden of the oil press. He falls to the ground and cries out just loud enough for you to hear, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Later, you hear Jesus pray again with a strained voice, saying, My Father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. One more time, a third time, you hear Jesus pray about drinking from a cup. You wonder, does he mean the fourth cup that was skipped at the meal, the one that would have ended the Passover meal? And it all starts to make sense to you. Jesus said that the third cup was his blood, just like the blood of the lamb at Passover. Jesus said to eat the bread that was his body, just as eating the guff or the body of the lamb was part of the Passover tradition. Jesus even said to eat and drink these things in memory of him, using the word remembrance, which is more than a memorial and certainly not a reenactment, but is a full participation in the first Passover 1,500 years earlier. And then it suddenly occurs to you that Jesus is the new Passover lamb. You then recall that 30 years prior to this moment, one of the priests at the temple, Zechariah, had gone in to offer prayers. And when he came out, he was mute, but motioned that he had seen an angel who told him that he and his elderly wife would have a baby. And that baby was born, and they named him John. John, John, the baptizer, you and your friends followed at the Jordan River. Suddenly, you remember John one hot day pointing to Jesus and saying, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. As you remember that day, your heart sinks as you begin to realize that the Passover lamb does not make it out alive. You hear a ruckus and see Judas walking fast, leading a group of chief priests who are surrounded by soldiers. Jesus is arrested and taken away. You follow as far as you can, but stop in your tracks and stare at a home along the way. Outside their door, you see a slaughtered lamb on a cross next to a wooden door frame that is stained with blood. And you wonder, what does all this mean? You think, we didn't have the fourth cup, we didn't finish the Passover meal. Jesus is being pushed farther and farther away from you. But he looks over his shoulder in, and in the moonlight, you see that he makes eye contact with you for a brief moment, just as he had done when he washed your feet a few hours before. And though he doesn't say anything, you get the sense that he is saying, all for you. Your adrenaline is pumping as Jesus is led away. You and the other disciples follow as far and as long as you can. With Passover, though, people are everywhere, camping in every open space throughout the city and the temple. It's late and you're tired, but none of you can even think of going back to the upper room to sleep. So you wander throughout the night looking for friends, fearful that someone will recognize you and call you out, so you hide your face. The group is angry with Judas, feeling his betrayal against Jesus is a betrayal against all of you. 
Let us pause now as we prepare to enter into the Good Friday story. Across the temple square, a fire burns, the thick black smoke rising into the pre-dawn sky. You spot Peter, who is arguing with someone. You safely keep your distance. Then you hear it. A rooster crows. And you can tell that Peter has heard it too. Now you desperately want to go to Peter to see what's next, but Peter in his shame cries and runs away. Word comes that Jesus, Jesus will soon be tried in court. You and your friends rush there, but you're still afraid for your own life. You ask the others if you all should hide. Won't they arrest us too, you ask? On your way to the Praetorium, you see another one of those Passover lambs on a cross-shaped skewer, and suddenly you're filled with dread that you might be captured and executed. <coughs> but you push through your fear for the moment and discover that you're preoccupied with the fourth cup at last night's Passover, the cup that Jesus didn't bless and share, the cup you were certain Jesus asked God to let pass from him when he was praying in the garden of the oil press. You begin to think about how Jesus said last night that he wouldn't drink the fruit of the vine again until he is in his Father's kingdom. And you have a deep sense that all of these cups and all of this wine, including the wine that Jesus said was his blood, are all somehow connected. Then Jesus is convicted. The crowd goes wild. You have hope when you hear Pilate present Barabbas and Jesus and ask which should be released. Maybe, just maybe, they'll release your friend. But the roar of the crowd to release Barabbas and crucify Jesus is deafening. Their hatred impossible to understand. The reality of Jesus' fate sinks in when you see the cross placed on his shoulders which are bleeding and sagging from the whips that he has endured. You strain to see what's on his head and realize it's a crown of thorns digging into his flesh. You understand that they're mocking him as a king. All you want to do is yell and tell them that they have the wrong image, that he's not a king, he's a lamb. But the noise makes it impossible to be heard and the vitriol of the crowd makes it impossible to reason with them. And your mind yet again returns to that fourth cup and the wine, when you see the noble women of Jerusalem coming with their jars of wine for the convicted criminal named Jesus. As a first century Jew, you know that these women are keeping the tradition of giving someone led to execution a goblet of wine containing a grain of frankincense in order to numb the senses. But Jesus never takes this wine from them as he stumbles towards Calvary. The cross looks bigger than usual full of splinters. But it could be that Jesus looks small in his weakness. Your friend falls under the weight of the cross beam that he's carrying, and one of the centurions, tall and muscular, in charge, in command, grabs an onlooker and tells him that he must carry the cross for Jesus. Without complaint, the man takes up the cross to help, and Jesus looks at the man with gratitude. The crack of the whip punches the air as Jesus and the man start moving again. The crowd is pressing in to see this convicted criminal. There is yelling and screaming. Men spit on your friend. Women curse his name. Your anger, fear, and adrenaline force you to shove and push through the crowd. Your dear friend Jesus screams a deep wail as he is nailed to the cross. Blood spurts out of his wrist and feet as the nails are driven with a large hammer. It's painful to watch, but not nearly as painful as enduring it. Jesus is hoisted up between two men you never even noticed until this moment. You see how weak your friend is as he struggles to breathe. Jesus pushes himself up with his legs just enough to allow air into his lungs before weakness overtakes him and he slouches down again beneath his arms. There is blood everywhere, especially on the cross that seems painted red, 
like the doorposts on Passover. His lack of oxygen is turning his face blue. Though it's midday, everything turns as dark as night as the sun seems to disappear altogether. It stays that way for three hours. Women scream. Children cry. The night animals start to come out and make their noises confused by the darkness. At three o'clock, the sun returns and illuminates the scene. Fear grips the crowd that is slowly dissipating as everyone hurries home from the horror before sundown. You catch a glimpse of the woman you know to be Jesus' mom, Mary. You've met her before. She used to look so young, so innocent, radiant almost. Now she looks like an old lady with deep wrinkles, the kind that come with deep grief. She's clinging to Jesus' best friend in the group, John, holding herself up by hanging onto his clothes. Exhausted and under the strain of not being able to breathe, Jesus commends his mom and best friend to take care of each other. His mother, Mary, nods but cannot bear to look up at her son. She does not want to see him naked or suffering or die. You watch Jesus closely for some last-minute miracle, some sign that it will not end this way. You move closer because it seems that Jesus is trying to say something. Jesus strains to whisper, I thirst. With that, a soldier dips a sponge in the goblet of wine, puts it on a stick, and puts it near Jesus' mouth. As he drinks the wine from the sponge, you realize that this is it. This is the fourth and final cup from last night's Passover meal. The cup that Jesus had skipped until now. Just as it is making sense, you hear Jesus say, It is finished. And with that, he dies. His body goes limp as he stops breathing stops fighting for comfort. His lifeless body simply hangs there. A soldier lances his side, and a gush of blood and water pour out. That blood and water makes you think yet again of the water and wine that Jesus mingled together at dinner last night, the same water and wine mixture that he said was his blood of the new covenant. Jesus the new Passover lamb is dead. Now what? The sun is getting low on the horizon. The Sabbath will soon start. There is a scramble to get him off the cross and get him buried in a tomb before sundown. By the time he's laid in the tomb and you join the others on a walk back into Jerusalem, you are emotionally, physically, and spiritually exhausted. Collapsing in the upper room on a large pillow, the flicker of candlelight illuminates the cup on the table from last night's meal. Jesus' voice echoes in your mind until you fall asleep. You hear his voice saying, Do this in memory of me. Let us pause as we enter into Holy Saturday and Easter Sunday. The Sabbath morning arrives, Saturday. The morning sunlight washes over your face with warmth, but its brightness is so sharp that it makes your eyes feel bruised even when they're closed. As you sit up, your other friends are sleeping. Peter is snoring loudly in the corner. Philip is so motionless that you wonder if he's dead, waiting to watch his chest rise or fall with a breath. The table is exactly as it was left on Thursday night. With the arrest and crucifixion of Jesus, no one took the time to clean up. You know that it will stay that way for yet another day since the work of cleanup is forbidden on the Sabbath. Crusts of bread, bones of lamb, leftover Hereseth sauce remain. As everyone wakes up, conversation about yesterday's events quickly turn into questions about what to do now. 
Some of your friends want to violate the Sabbath and go to the tomb where Jesus was laid. But you and others make the compelling argument that surely you'll be watched closely and could, be, could meet the same fate and that there's no good reason to break the commandment of God to rest on the Sabbath. <coughs> the decision to say put is confirmed when word comes that the chief priests have requested and received permission to place Roman guards at the tomb. Word also comes that Judas has been found hanging from a tree. Two friends now dead. Grief overwhelms you. The Sabbath day passes slowly. There is much conversation about what Jesus said Thursday night, how he said it, and what it all means. You chime in about your own thoughts regarding the skipping of the fourth cup, the prayer in the garden, about letting the cup pass from him, and Jesus is taking wine at the moment of death. Everyone understands the conclusion you're laying out that Jesus is the new Passover lamb. Everyone has different ideas of what that even means, but there is general agreement that if the first Passover lamb saved your ancestors from death in Egypt, how will Jesus, as the new Passover lamb, save you and your descendants from death? Someone asks the question, if the first Passover lamb set our ancestors free from slavery, what slavery does Jesus, the new Passover lamb, set us free from? And yet another friend asks, if the first Passover lamb started the exodus to the promised land, what exodus and what promised land is Jesus, the new Passover lamb, starting? Where are we going? Where is this new promised land? And then Thomas reminds everyone, remember when the teacher said that he was going to prepare a place for us? And I said we didn't know where he was going, but he said that we know the way? He is the way, and the truth, and the life. Remember? Don't you remember? Thomas's voice is hoarse from two days of screaming and crying. The events that have taken place, the slowness of the day, and the depth of conversation lull you back to sleep. You awaken early in the morning, Sunday, the first day of the week, the moonlight, the only thing illuminating the room. You hear jars clanging and hushed whispers. They are busy cleaning up. You hear them leave, shutting the door behind them as you fall back asleep in utter exhaustion. But you don't sleep for long before the women return in a panic. They are speaking so fast and are out of breath, making it nearly impossible to understand what they're saying. The rock's been moved, they say. He's gone. His body is gone, they say. There was an earthquake. We saw an angel. Everyone, it seems, is talking over them, shouting questions. All of these things, they say, make no sense, but you are filled with dread, wondering if you will have to go into the danger of Jerusalem looking for the stolen body of your friend Jesus. Peter and John, they run out of the upper room, but you and others are paralyzed by fear. If they've stolen the body of Jesus, who knows what they'll do to you? Peter and John soon return and confirm all that the women had shared. The huge stone that had taken nearly all of you to roll into place has been moved. Inside, the burial clothes are placed to one side with the cloth that had been wrapped around his head rolled up and put to the other side. Yes, his body is gone. Peter tells you that even the guards were confused. Even though you know that the penalty for them falling asleep on the job is death, you and others quickly conclude that the body of your friend Jesus has, without a doubt, been stolen the air in the room is heavy. There's no joy. There are no songs of praise and thanksgiving. There is only the dread associated with the sudden realization that at any moment you could be captured and executed just as Jesus has been. All you want to do is stay in the security and safety of the upper room, locking the door. Your fear of the temple leaders holding you captive there with your friends, your group dwindling, now with the absence of both Jesus, Jesus and Judas. You feel stuck in an in-between place, 
a desire to go back to your previous way of life, the life you had before you met Jesus, and the unnerving sense that this is not over, that you've not yet reached the end of what you're supposed to do, that in fact this may be just the beginning. And the words of Jesus come back to you again. Do this in remembrance of me. My friends, let us take leave of the upper room and the fear and the confusion that is there that morning. And let us come back here to our present time. Here in this time and space, we know that the group wasn't captured that day, though eventually some were captured and executed for their belief. We also know that Jesus' body was not stolen, but that he rose from the dead, appearing to his friends again in the upper room and on the road to Emmaus. And we'll hear those stories in the coming weeks. We also know the answers to some of the questions that might have been asked among the disciples. How will Jesus, as the new Passover lamb, save us from death? Through his resurrection. What slavery does the new Passover lamb free us from? The slavery of sin. What promised land does the new Passover lamb beckon us towards in this new exodus? Not an earthly land, but the heavenly kingdom, where Christ awaits to drink with us that final Passover cup at the heavenly banquet. Yes, we know the rest of the story, that Jesus died for our sins, and in so doing opened wide the gates of heaven, restoring God's creation to fullness with him. This knowledge beckons us to rejoice, to sing, to praise, joining the choir of angels and archangels saying, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Amen.